A warm welcome to everybody for today's edition of the Siam PD seminar. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. So we have the great pleasure today of welcoming uh, Luis Silvestre, who is a professor at the University of Chicago. His biography is already available also on the seminar page. Uh, Luis is a leading expert in the regularity theory of elliptic and parabolic partial differential equations. His uh, contributions to that theory are extremely varied and it's not feasible to list them all, but in particular, uh, fundamental and groundbreaking results on the regularity of uh, non-local equations were obtained by himself together with Luis Silvestre some time ago. And more recently, uh, Luis, in, uh, together with Cyril Lambert, as well as Clément Mouault, have uh, discovered that insights given from that theory based on maximum principle and Harnack inequality approach, combined with uh, more classical approaches in the theory of the Boltzmann equation, permit to uh, actually build a very complete regularity theory for the Boltzmann equation, provided macroscopic quantities are assumed bounded. A, one of the series of works they have on that subject is published in uh, Siam Journal, Mathematical Analysis, and it's one of the most quoted papers there. So I believe that today, Luis will tell us a little bit more about that work, as well as the whole research program on the Boltzmann equation. So once more, thank you very much for being here and I'll pass, the, I'll pass to Luis for his talk. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I, it's, uh, I'm uh, very happy to be invited to give uh, this talk. Uh, and thank you, uh, Boyan, for the introduction and for the introduction even to my talk, uh, uh, I would say. Um, so the talk is all about this, this paper that was published in the Siam Journal the one on lower bounds for the Boltzmann equation, which is part of a larger program. Excuse, excuse me, there is, there is an intervention. There is a participant who needs to, to mute his, microphone, his or her microphone. So like I was saying, this is a lower bounds for the Boltzmann equation. It's, it's, it's a piece in a larger puzzle uh, which is uh, about finding estimates for the Boltzmann equation that are conditional to macroscopic bounds. So let's start from the beginning and let's see what this is that we are talking about here. So let's describe what the Boltzmann equation is, right? The Boltzmann equation uh, is an equation that describes the evolution of the density of particles in, in a gas. It's a, it sits at a, at a mesoscopic scale between the microscopic scale that would be the description of the exact position and velocity of every one of all the uh, uh, many particles uh, uh, that are in a gas and the macroscopic description of the state of a fluid that would be given by the Euler or the Navier-Stokes equation. The Boltzmann equation is in between. We have a function f that represents the density of particles with respect to their position and their velocity, right? So we have the the, den the, the density of, how, of, of you know, approximately the, how many particles we have uh, at each location and for each velocity. We have an evolution on how it's going to uh, evolve in time given by the, by the Boltzmann equation. So the left-hand side of the equation is just a pure transport equation. If we had all the particles just moving in straight lines following their velocities, we would simply have that the transport equation is equal to zero. The particles would just move in straight lines in space following their velocity. But then we have some interaction between the particles and that's uh, encoded in, the, in this Boltzmann collision operator that we write QFF. There is a quadratic operator because it takes into account uh, binary interactions uh, between particles. So now I'm gonna describe what this operator Q is. Uh, the bad thing about the Boltzmann equation is that the operator Q is complicated. So um, it's very difficult to explain in, in a talk for people who haven't seen it before. So the Boltzmann collision operator is this quadratic operator, this nonlinear uh, inter integral operator. So there is some integral here, there is a, actually a double integral. It involves f uh, always evaluated at the same time and at the same time x. So it's a, an operator that acts in the velocity variable only. 
right? So for fixed t and x, I evaluate f at different values of velocity and I integrate it. So here when I write f, I mean f at t x v. When I write f star, I mean f at t x v star. V star is one of the variables of integration. And then there is a v prime and a v prime star. So what are all these v, v star, v prime star, and v prime, star, and v prime? So at each point, there may be a particle of velocity v colliding with another particle of velocity v star. Uh, well, actually, the opposite of this picture. A particle with velocity v colliding with another particle of velocity v star. And then after collision, they change their velocities. Because of that, there is a loss term, which is we are losing particles at velocity v because some of the particles of velocity v are colliding with particles at, with other velocities. But we're also gaining uh, some new particles of velocity v, which are particles with another velocity v prime, which are colliding with particles of velocity v prime star. So if v prime star collides with another particle of velocity v prime, it may become a particle of velocity v and velocity v star, and we have this gain term, right? Um, so after a collision, uh, if, 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 if the particles have velocity v prime and v prime star, they, be, they may become you know, some other velocity. And uh, we cannot fully predict what velocity they'll become, but we know that because of conservation of momentum, we will have that the sum of the velocities remains constant after the collision. And because of conservation of energy, the sum of the square of the velocities remains constant after the collision. So these are the two constraints that we have for the choice of V prime and V prime star if we know V and V star. So because of these two constraints, one can say that V prime and V prime star are the endpoints of the diameter of the same sphere that V and V prime, uh, uh, V and V star uh, are also diameter. So the V, the, 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 these four velocities are four points on a sphere. Uh, so anyway, there, there are some restrictions of what these, these points have to be. And because of that, uh, this, this velocity is V prime and V prime star are parameterized by a spherical variable. And I didn't write the, the parameterization. But anyway, this is some way of parameterizing the, pos the possible pre and post collision and velocities. And this whole double integral is the Boltzmann collision operator. There is this kernel B, which tells us the rate by which each deviation angle takes place. So this theta is the deviation angle between V and V, v, and v prime, and V minus V star is just that. It's V minus V star, the difference between these two velocities. So there are different modeling choices for this kernel B, right? Um, so anyway, complicated integral differential operators. For those who have seen it before, uh, it's not that complicated. For those who see, see for the first time, it takes a little bit of time to get used to it. What do you see? It's a, it's a, there is an integral. There isn't any derivative anywhere to be seen. Um, for any kernel B, all Gaussian functions are stationary solutions. That's a, an important fact. So all this, this in, in, in kinetic theory, the Gaussian functions are called Maxwellians. Uh, for whatever reasons. And they are the stationary solutions of the Boltzmann equation. So if you take a function that is constant in T and X and is a Gaussian function in V centered anywhere and with any parameters A and B, then that's always a stationary solution of the Boltzmann equation. So, so these, these are the Maxwellian solution. The stationary solutions in kinetic equations are called Maxwellians. <coughs> All right. Uh, yeah. So like I I said there are different modeling choices for this kernel B, depending on how we believe that the particles interact at the microscopic level. You know, you may think that the particles are like billiard balls that just bounce against each other with a perfect elastic uh, collision. Or you may think something, something else. You may think that the, the, the particles are like sponges that interact in some other way, or maybe the particles are like, uh, uh, and repel each other by some sort of uh, potential. And those different modeling choices are reflected in different, in different versions of this kernel B. So if we think about the hard spheres model, that is particles bouncing against each other, you get a relatively simple 
uh, kernel B. If you think about the power law potential, that is, think, think about the microscopic model in which the particles start repelling each other by some power law potential when they are sufficiently close to each other. Then the kernel B that we get has this other will be a power of R times a negative power of the deviation angle. Notice that this is a very negative power. So in fact, the integral that we have here with respect to this spherical variable, uh, this kernel B will not be integrable with respect to the spherical variable in, in the power law potentials case. So the operator is still well defined because there is a cancellation here between, because if F is a smooth function, then because of this subtraction, we have a cancellation when F, when V is the same as V prime, these two terms coincide. And then the singularity of B is uh, compensated by the cancellation in the first factor. So the, the operator still makes sense, even though this, this kernel B is non-integrable. So that's something similar of, as in the expression for the fractional Laplacian, that you will have a non-integrable kernel. And if the power law potential by which the particles repel each other was a Coulombian potential, that it would be a very reasonable model for, uh, for uh, modeling plasmas, then uh, Q, actually, this operator would degenerate because this, this kernel B would be too degenerate. If you take minus D plus one minus two, then this is exactly the borderline degenerates in B in which the operator ceases to make sense as an integral differential operator. And it actually uh, converges to a second order operator and that's the Landau equation, okay? Which is a limit of the Boltzmann equation when this parameter S converges to one. So you see there are different possibilities of this kernel B. And, and it makes sense to study all of them uh, because you know who knows what the what are the ones that appear in physics. So there is a common terminology called the cutoff assumption. So the cutoff assumption is oops, I didn't want to do that. Uh, how to do that? Can you see? No. Well, anyway. Um, so the cutoff assumption consists in assuming that this kernel B is integrable with respect to the spherical variable. Um, you see that with respect to the previous um, examples that I gave, the hard spheres model satisfies the cutoff assumptions, but the power law potential model doesn't, right? So this is a type of kernels for the Boltzmann equations uh, that let's say in the 20th century, it sounds like a long time ago, but it's not, Hello. It seems that he is disconnected. Yeah, it seems he disconnected. Yeah. Or froze. Yeah, I there's something I, I definitely wrong. He's completely frozen. Yeah. I ah, he left. Okay, he will. Probably he will. Is yeah, he's gonna. He's gonna enter again. Okay. He's going to enter again. Hi. I disconnected, my wife, I disconnected. When, what was the last thing you heard from me? The, uh, about the cutoff, you wanted to show the example uh, why the heart sphere um, are distinct from the other one. Okay, so I made it to this, uh, to this slide and I, I, I accidentally cut off, cut off. You saw that? Yeah, we saw that you cut off yourself. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. So you saw, so that means that I, I wasn't offline for very long. I was afraid that, that, that I had disconnected from the Wi Fi in my first slide, and then uh, no. I gave a <laughs> talk. And, and didn't that happen to Boyan once? I don't know. You mean here? No. You know, it happened to somebody in some, in some talk that I, that I saw once that someone got disconnected from the, from the Wi-Fi and gave the whole talk. I know it was to Andrei Schlatos. It was a talk to Andrei Schlatos at the University of Chicago. 
that he, he got disconnected from the Wi-Fi in the middle of the talk, and he just finished the talk. He gave like, he spe spoke like for 10 slides. And then, <laughs> then when he realized uh, the whole talk was gone, and he had been speaking to nobody uh, for half of the seminar. Can you put your slides yes. up? I, I think that this, uh, this webinar is timed, so we don't have too much okay. time. So I wasn't, sh I see, okay. So I was saying, in the cutoff model, you can think about the gain term and the loss term. So you can do an analysis of the uh, collision operator as this difference of two positive terms. In the, in the non-cutoff uh, assumption, if, if this is non-integrable, then you cannot do that because you need the cancellation to make sense of the operator. So the analysis will, not, will never be by splitting the operator in gain and loss term, okay? So the, what I'm focusing on is in the non-cutoff uh, case. In fact, all my research in the Boltzmann equation has always been in for non-cutoff models uh, for reasons that I will, I, I will explain soon. So let's see, what would we expect the Boltzmann equation to do? Uh, you know, mathematicians tend to be optimistic. I don't know why. But um, let's suppose that we are very optimistic and you think that the will behave. What would you expect? Well, why would you expect that if you have any initial data, let's say reasonable, like a positive initial data that decays uh, as V goes to infinity and is smooth, then even if the initial data is not positive everywhere, it will become immediately positive everywhere. Because you know, imagine a, a, a gas filling up a room, but with a little vacuum somewhere. If you let it evolve, the vacuum will be immediately filled up, right? So uh, vac they just don't like to have vacuum regions. So the, the function should become uh, positive everywhere immediately, okay? Second thing is uh, it should stay, uh, it should converge to zero as V goes to infinity, you know, for large velocities, the distribution of the of particles should have decay. I, I'm, I'm not expecting to see lots of particles with very large velocities. Then as t goes to infinity, it should converge to equilibrium and equilibrium is a Maxwellian function. So it should converge to this Maxwellian function as t goes to infinity. And then even if the initial data is not C infinity, in the non cutoff case, the solution should become C infinity because the non cutoff case has a regularization effect. And that's the, the thing that is special of the non cutoff, and it's not true in cutoff case. The cutoff Boltzmann doesn't have any regularization effect. Whereas for the non cutoff, uh, the singularity in the kernel is forcing the function to become smoother. It's like a fractional Laplacian in a way. Uh, so it's like a diffusion of, it's like an integral diffusion operator, but we kind of have to identify how. It's a diffusion operator. But anyway, this is just an optimistic vision. So this is what you would expect to happen. So what is it that we know how to do? This is what we, that is what we would expect. What is it that is, that is precisely and rigorous proved so far? Nothing, right? We don't know how to do any of this unless we make further assumptions in the function and assumptions that are unprovable in a way, right? Uh, why is it natural that, that we know nothing? Um, you see, if you take an average in velocity of the solution of the Boltzmann equation, you can recover these hydrodynamic quantities, these macroscopically meaningful quantities. If you take the, the interval of f in velocity, you get the mass density. If you take the interval times v, you get the momentum density that you divide by rho, and you get the velocity. And then, oh, it should be a square here. Um, if, you take, if you take like this variance, you get the temperature density. So these are macroscopic quantities that in certain asymptot asymptotic limit, they converge to a solution of the compressible Euler equation. Now the compressible Euler equation is an equation that develops singularities in finite time. Um, up to second order expansion as epsilon goes to zero, you get some, the next term would be epsilon uh, Laplacian or something. So you get a Navier-Stokes equation. So you get the compressible Navier-Stokes equation to the second order expansion in this limit. So the equations from fluid dynamics are in a way obtained from the Navier-Stokes equation. And since the equations in fluid dynamics are complicated, and there are lots of open questions, uh, you can 
expect that the Boltzmann equation will be will be complicated as well because it contains those equations in a way, and it's more complex. It contains more information than the hydrodynamic equations. Um, the compressible Euler equation develops singularities at least in two different ways. One is as shocks, like in Berger's equation, we get a discontinuity from the flow of the equation. That's not really a, dis, a, a, a singularity that you will see in a kinetic equation, because in kinetic equations, you have different velocities that are allowed to coexist in the function v. So what happens at one velocity doesn't affect what happens at another velocity. So a shock is not really a singularity for the kinetic equations. But the Euler equation also has these implosion singularities, the compressible Euler equation. That is like everything flows into a point and then all these quantities go to infinity. Uh, Frank Mel, uh, Pierre Raphael, Stefter, and Ronianski, that they study this, uh, the, the stability of this implosion singularity for the compressible Euler equation. And since this, Implosion singularities exist for the Euler equation for the compressible Euler. One may guess that there might be an implosion singularity for 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 Boltzmann. You know, it's not so obvious. So it's, it's just a guess. But at least I don't I don't know any reason to rule it out. And so all these difficulties from hydrodynamic equations are still difficulties for the Boltzmann equation. So since these difficulties are unmanageable with our current technology. I'm going to make an assumption to rule them out, right? Uh, this is what we can do. We have to do whatever we can. So I'm going to assume that the mass density, the energy density, and the entropy density remain bounded and away from vacuum. By making that assumption, what I'm doing is effectively I'm ruling out the implosion singularity. I don't want my. equation to evolve in happen. Most likely the, there are implosions in for the Boltzmann equation. Because of that, I'm just going to make an assumption to say, well, I don't want to have an implosion singularity. Is there any other type of singularity for the Boltzmann equation? Or once we rule out the implosion singularity, are the, is, the, is the equation going to uh, smooth out my solutions? And that's what we're gonna prove. We're gonna prove that once we make this assumption that the macroscopic quantities are remain bounded and away from vacuum, then the solution of the, of, the, of the equation satisfies all those optimistic uh, hypotheses in two slides ago. So it stays smooth, it's, uh, it's gonna be bounded below by, by a Maxwellian, and it's gonna converge to a Maxwellian as time goes to infinity, right? So this macroscopic assumption uh, is enough to verify all the optimistic assumptions. Nice. So that conditional regularity problem. Cut off an equation in some range of parameters for this gamma and S that were the parameters of the non cut off kernels. So I'm assuming that the mass density is bounded below and above. The bound below, below is because I want to avoid vacuum regions. I'm assuming that the energy density is bound above and the entropy density is bounded above. And then we're gonna, this is gonna be like the, the subject of this talk to prove that there is a, the function is at, as for any positive time will be bounded below by some Maxwellian. So I have A and B depending on time. That's because the bound from below is, 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 is not achieved at time zero. You know, in, I need to move a little bit in time. So. As soon as you move a little bit in time, you're going to have a bound from below. Uh, as t goes to infinity, this converges to a fixed uh, Maxwellian. And then all the derivatives of all order are also bounded from above. Uh, so this is the regularity estimates. This is the lower bound. So the talk today, I'm going to explain the lower bound uh, rather than the regularity, which is sort of new compared to the other talks that I give. Uh, you can, uh, I have uh, some talks on YouTube discussing the regularity estimates. but one on uh, on thing, okay, and all these bounds depend only on this constant, on this macroscopic constants, e the energy, the entropy density, and the lower and upper bound for the mass density. Okay, 
All right, so in order to get though that, I have to understand the Boltzmann collision operator and understand where the diffusion is. So how is this Boltzmann collision operator an interdifferential inter diffusion operator? So like Boyan said at the beginning of the, when my introduction, there's been this subject about interdifferential diffusions, non-local equations that was very active in the last 20, 10, 15 years. So we have been studying uh, uh, parabolic equations with interdifferential diffusions that were uh, some <coughs> interdifferential quotients weighted by some kernel I integrated. Um, in the Boltzmann collision operator, it's not immediately apparent uh, how that diffusion, where the diffusion is. I mean, we see some difference there. We see some uh, kernel and, and double integral, but it doesn't have exact form of those non-local equations. So I want to move terms around to make it look like one. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add and subtract this extra term. F prime star F, right? So F is F evaluated at V, and then I'm evaluating F at uh, V prime star, the same as, as this factor, right? And I do this so that I can get this F prime star common factor on the, on the top line, and I can get F as a common factor on the bottom line, right? So by doing that, the first term is this one on top, so it comes out of the integral. The second term is actually a lower order term. It's F of V times this translation invariant operator in F, which is gonna turn out to be a convolution of F with some fixed function depending on B. So this one was known already in the kinetic community from something called the cancellation lemma, that this factor is actually F convolved with a fixed gamma, that is V to the power gamma in the non cut off case. So this is a lower order term. This term is the one that is like, a, like an interdifferential diffusion. So I have F prime minus F multiplied times certain kernel that depends on F, right? But that's the nature of nonlinear equations. A uh, nonlinear equation is most often same as a linear, but the coefficients are depending on the function F. Well, actually that's what a quasi-linear equation is uh, uh, literally, right? A quasi-linear equation is an equation, uh, let's say a second order quasi-linear equation, is an equation that is in second order, but the coefficients in front of the second derivatives depend on the function itself. So this is a quasi-linear interdifferential equation. So it's a kernel that is gonna be of order 2s because of the, the assumptions on the non cutoff assumptions on the kernel B, but it's gonna be weighted by something depending on the function f, right? So I like to write it as f prime minus f times k sub f where this is a kernel computed in terms of F. And this is the interdifferential diffusion. This is a positive kernel. After doing a change of variables, you can compute what this K sub F is in terms of B and it, oh, I'm, I'm missing the F prime, F prime star here. Um, so I have a kernel depending on the function F. Now, you may wonder from the very beginning, I made this assumption the hydrodynamic quantities, and then we're gonna prove uh, estimates on regularity estimates or lower bounds based, depending on these hydrodynamic uh, assumptions only. Conditional regularity estimates, if you compare with, let's say, Navier-Stokes, when you do the pro-deserving condition, you prove the, sol the solution is C, in C infinity, they're always based on some scaling argument. You have a, 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 an assumption that makes the equation super critical. Is that what's going on in the Boltzmann equation? Well, no. The reason why I make the, 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 the role that the assumptions are, play, are, are playing is different. So when I make assumptions that says, say that the, these uh, microscopic quantities are bounded, what, I, what I'm doing is I'm making the assumptions that allow me to, to conclude that this kernel K sub F is elliptic. So in the interdifferential equation community, one has some conditions that make a kernel, even some degenerate kernels, elliptic of order 2s. So the kernel has to be in a way comparable to the kernel of the fraction of Laplacian, but you know, there is some flexibility in that. I mean, I'm not gonna explain it in, in detail because it's not, it's so simple. Um, so there are some conditions on the kernel that would make this operator elliptic of order 2s in the sense that it's gonna be an operator from HS to H minus S, and it's gonna be coercive with respect to the HS norm. And those conditions are satisfied as soon as F 
satisfies the macroscopic uh, bounds. So those bounds on the macroscopic quantities ensure that this kernel case is going to be elliptical for the assumption, this macroscopic assumption that I make that everything is conditional to is actually in order for the diffusion to be elliptical for the twist. So it's what makes my diffusion elliptic. Otherwise, I wouldn't have the right ellipticity uh, to, to kickstart my, my estimates, OK? Um, so, so this is the way to, to find the, 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 the ellipticity in the, in the kernel. So let's talk about lower bounds. Uh, let's talk about uh, some early results on, low, on lower bounds. Because you know lower bounds is one of these very natural questions about the Boltzmann equation. So uh, obviously, so of course, it has been studied for a lot of years. So the first result is pretty old, as you can see. You also have space homogeneous solutions, that's solutions that don't depend on x. You also have the cutoff model, right? And you was assuming some decay for large velocities. And under those assumptions, Carleman proved that the function f was bound. Then there is a much later paper uh, getting uh, a Gaussian lower bound also for a space homogeneous and cutoff case. Then Clement Mujo proved in 2005, studied the space inhomogeneous problem with periodic boundary conditions in space. And got uh, a good only these hydrodynamic bounds, the same as uh, I mentioned before, very similar to the ones I mentioned before. Um, and he also got a, a result for the non cutoff case that is quite a bit worse. It's with an exponent here, it's a positive exponent actually. Uh, an exponent k for some k larger than two. So it's actually no, minus here. No, sorry, sorry. K squared. Okay. So it's a positive exponent there. So uh, this is this is a this decays much faster than a Gaussian because k is a large number. Uh, so he got um, this lower bound, but assuming that the function f is smooth with certain quantitative bounds. So let me say. The way he dealt with the non cutoff Boltzmann equation was a little bit cheap. Um, he's not listening to this, right? Well, yeah, I think he's fine. Um, so, the, what he did is he took the singularity of the kernel and then he sort of uh, split the inter operator between the small deviation angle and the large deviation angle. For small deviation angle, he used that the function was smooth to get just a rough upper bound of that part of the kernel. And then he did the same proof as the cutoff for the rest of the kernel. And because of that, he has a bigger error term and he gets a pretty, uh, inco not, not such a great lower bound, but based on regularity assumptions for inconveniences of this paper. But this is the first paper that is actually able, able to get some lower bound in the non-cutoff case, okay? so. Non surprisingly, the way we're in, 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 the, in our result, which is also joined with Clement Mouchot and Cyril Inbert, we don't fight the singularity. It's like we don't cut off anything around the, the origin and, and we actually exploit the, the, the diffusive character of the operator in a more precise way so that we don't have to make any error term, basically. Um, so this is our our theorem. We have f a solution of the non cutoff Boltzmann equation. We assume uh, that the hydrodynamic quantities are bounded, meaning that the mass energy is bounded below. Then we get a lower bound with a, with a precise Gaussian lower bound, and depending only on those hydrodynamic bounds. So we don't have to make any further regularity assumption on f. And we get a perfect lower bound because uh, we know that as t goes to infinity, F will converge to a Maxwellian distribution that has a decay comparable to this, right? So anyway, so this is our result. I'm gonna try to explain the rough idea of the proof. I'm gonna make like an outline because I don't want to. I don't want you. I don't want you to be bored with computations. Um, so the first the first step in order to get a lower bound that has a certain decay is to be able to get a lower bound for small velocities. To say f is bounded below for all velocities less than one, let's say. 
And that's something that one gets from the weak Harnack inequality. The weak Harnack inequality was something that was proved in an earlier paper uh, that I have uh, joined. Um, and it's a, it's the, it also implies the Heller continuity of the, of, of, of the solutions of the, of the Boltzmann equation. So the weak Harnack inequality says we have a function, a positive function, which is a solution of an integral different, in, in this case, a super solution, I have an inequality of an integral differential kinetic equation. So what do I mean? We have transport equal to an integral differential equation acting in the velocity variable. Here k is any kernel. It doesn't matter that well, whether it comes from the Boltzmann equation operator or whether it's any or what, or, or, or if it's any other kernel coming from anywhere. Provided you have any kernel satisfying some mild ellipticity assumptions, then if the function f is large in a set of positive measure, then it's going to be it's going to detach from zero in you know positive time and the half cylinder, right? So this is the weak Harnack inequality. The function f is large at many points in measure, then it's large, and then it can be larger than something everywhere when you go to the um, to the half uh, kinetic cylinder. This would be like the unit kinetic cylinder. This would be like the half kinetic cylinder. And notice that this is seemingly for linear equations because k is any kernel. And I'm looking for a solution of this linear equation. Linear is a very uh, deceiving term because um, when you prove a, an estimate for an, an equation like this, where k is any kernel, you're actually proving an estimate for linear or nonlinear equations. k may or may not depend on f. So k is some kernel. As soon as it satisfies certain electricity assumptions, then the, S, the weak Harnack inequality holds. And you're actually going to kind of use Heller continuity from this. It's like, this is like the de Choch in Nash Mosser theorem, right? The, the, the theorem is seemingly for linear equations, but then the coefficients may depend on the solution when you apply it for a nonlinear equation, right? Um, it's also similar as in the Krilov Safonov uh, Harnack inequality, right? So, in fact, the proof of this uses the techniques that started from the Georges uh, techniques uh, in the proof of the so-called the georgi nash mosser theory. All right, so this gives us a lower bound for velocities, let's say smaller than one half or one or any fixed number because they, these numbers one half and one are arbitrary, right? So applying this together with the lower bound on, on mass that we have, we get a lower bound for the function f whenever the velocity is less than a fixed number. That fixed number could be arbitrary, but then I don't know how the lower bound will depend on that fixed number. It's very implicit. Uh, so in practice, we just use this for, let's say, velocity is less than one. Whenever the velocity is less than one, we know that the function is gonna be less than delta, uh, provided that the time is a little bit positive, right? So this, uh, the weak Harnack inequality allows you to clear a solid ball from the origin where we have a lower bound, right? And now that we clear the solar ball, we want to expand the lower bound to larger velocities and get a precise um, uh, decay estimate for, for that lower bound. So the spreading lemma is the following. I have a function f, positive, which is a super solution of, I'm including only the first term in the Boltzmann collision operator. Why am I doing that? I mean, let's go back to the Boltzmann collision operator. I had two terms. The second one is always positive. This term is always positive, so it's always going to be pushing up. But this term in, is, has an f of v. So if f of v is zero, it's, the, it's not really making my, my lower bound spread. So the one that's going to make it spread is the diffusion term. So this term, I'm only going to ignore it because it's pushing in the right direction, but it's, it's not something I can easily quantify. So this term is positive. I can assume that f. Ft plus V, the transport term is greater or equal than the diffusion because it's actually equal to the diffusion term plus that other diffusion term. So what I'm gonna, what you have to focus on on the stuff in red for the inequality. If I have a lower bound for velocities less than R, but F is smaller than L in this ball, then when I go to the ball of, of radius square root of two times R, then I'm gonna get a lower bound of order L squared times some uh, rubbish factors that will not really be relevant for large radii, right? So what you have to get from the spreading lemma is the following. 
if the lower bound on radius r is l then the lower bound on radius square root two times mm -hmm. r will be l squared correction factors okay but that, those are not really going to affect the iteration later on how to prove this spreading lemma so you have a a bound on, on all of the radius r, let's say less that you know that f is less than, well, it was l in the previous slide. And I want to spread it to larger balls. So you take a, 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 a barrier function gonna, that is gonna be this phi t times, a of t times phi of v. Phi of v is some fixed bump function that is one in the ball of radius, uh, um, a little bit less than square root two times r, and is supported in the ball of radius square root of two times r. Right? So I'm trying phi times a factor a of t that is going to be starting at zero and it's going to be uh, becoming positive as time evolves. So what I want is I want to look at the first touching point between this barrier function from below and mm. my function f. Then I want to, is a classical barrier type argument uh, in PDs, right? When you want to prove some inequality for parabolic equations near the boundary or, or elliptic near the boundary, you look for these barrier functions and then you do some sort of comparison principle. But this is a non-local comparison principle that things are a little bit different, right? So we have all the equalities at the first touching point, the inequality for the time derivative, the equality for the gradient, and then we have the inequality for all the other values of v. From this inequality, we actually have that the interdifferential term splits between two terms, one of which is computable because it's just the interdifferential term applied to the barrier function phi. And the other one is positive because f prime is larger than my barrier. So this is a positive factor, right? So I have a solid uh, all right. So in order to find the factor A and see how A grows with time, we have to be able to estimate how positive this term is and get a low and upper bound on how bad this error term is, right? The error term is actually very easy to compute because phi is a fixed a smooth function that we actually chose. And for smooth functions, you can estimate a, a, an interoperator of order 2s um, in terms of the uh, C2 norm of phi and the L infinity norm of phi by some interpolation. So this is actually very easy to estimate using the um, ellipticity upper bound of the kernel K. But then we have to see how positive the other, the positive term is because that's really the good term, the term that is allowing the function to grow, right? This is the positive term that is really the one that is pushing the function to go upwards, okay? So you have f prime minus the barrier function evaluated at v prime. But as you can see, f is larger than the barrier function everywhere and is equal at v zero only, right? So this term is, is gonna be positive. So that's why this is a positive thing Intermediate times k sub f, right? So now I'm gonna have to go back and really remember what k was. And this is a slide that will be difficult to follow for those who have never seen the Boltzmann collision operator before, because I'm gonna ask you to remember what the Boltzmann collision operator was, right? So this kernel k, this integral was like multiplying times f prime star times b and integrating with respect to the original variables. And v prime, v prime star and v satisfy certain uh, conditions based on con of the conservation of, of momentum and conservation of energy in each collision. That they translate in the fact that they, if you take the angle between v prime star v and v star, this is a right angle. So here, here there is a right angle. That's the, pretty much the only uh, restriction you have if you don't set what V star is. So if I have any velocity V, the ball 
of uh, radius square this so this would be r and this one will be square root of two times r if v is within the ball of radius square root of two times r then i can find two v two points v prime and v prime star inside the ball of radius r uh that form a right angle with v right so if v is a little bit inside i'm gonna find uh, a lot of points v prime and v prime star that are inside the ball of radius r and contribute to this integral so for all those points f prime and f prime star are going to be larger than l whereas this error term that comes from the uh BAM function is a lot less because I want to be I want to I want to get this function to, to be to, to the level of L squared. So this is going to be at most L squared. So it's a lot less than L. So it's, this is a negligible term that I'm subtracting. So what I have here is L squared times uh, how much I'm integrating. How much I'm integrating is all the other factors that we had in the inequality, R to the D times something, something, something. So bottom line, this positive term. It's going to be of the order of L squared times other factors depending on R and, 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 and this, some other parameters that I had in the computation. But the most important thing is that you get an L squared in here, right? And that's why we got this that F in the ball of radius square root of two times R is going to be greater or equal than L squared. L was the lower bound in the ball of radius R. So when you multiply, the radius times square root of two, the lower bound uh, goes, is, is squared in a way, right? And why square root of two? Because square root of two is the largest V can be so that I can still find V prime and V prime star that are inside of the ball of radius R and form a right angle with V so that they actually contribute to this thing. Okay? All right, so now I claim that that's the, the, the iterate, the spreading lemma that will lead to a Gaussian function. So why Gaussian? So look at any Gaussian function. What's special about it? Well, how do, I, I, how do, how do you identify uh, the way a lower bound would spread in a, in, a, in a Gaussian function? Well, if I multiply V times square root of two, square, the V squared is multiplied times two, so you get uh, the square of the Gaussian. So that's exactly the iteration that leads to the Gaussian. When you multiply the radius times square root of two, the, the Gaussian is, or the lowest, or the lower bound of the Gaussian is squared, okay? So it shouldn't be surprising that having this uh, spreading lemma, when you just iterate it, you get the Gaussian for larger velocities, all right? All right, so that's the proof of the spreading lemma, which is the heart of the proof of the uh, Gaussian lower bounds that we have, uh, that we obtain uh, with Cyril and with Clement based on the hydrodynamic bounds. So what else is there to do for the Boltzmann equation? Uh, this is for always for the cutoff Boltzmann equation. Well, um, the upper bounds are proved in a similar way. Uh, you see that I, I use this barrier. I look at the first point where the barrier touches the, the solution of the Boltzmann equation from below. There is a similar argument to prove upper bounds for the Boltzmann equation. You look at the barrier that starts at plus infinity and starts going down. Look at the first point that it touches the solution of the Boltzmann equation. You evaluate the equation there, use all the hydrodynamic assumptions, and you actually can get uh, inequalities that lead to upper bounds in L infinity, even with any uh, algebraic rate with decay rate. So the upper bounds for the Boltzmann equation are proved similarly as these lower bounds. And then one can do conditional regularity estimates using the Georgi and Schauder techniques for kinetic inter-differential equations. So the Georgi technique is basically the weak handling inequality that I mentioned uh, in this talk. There is also Schauder techniques that is when you also assume that the kernel is held or continuous with respect to the, to the point, then you get further held or continuity for the uh, solution. This, so basically, you first prove that if you want to prove the regularity estimates for conditional regularity estimate for Boltzmann, you first prove the L infinity estimate. Then you prove the, Hel the Helder estimate using the Chochi, uh, the, the Chochi inequality. And then once you have that the solution is C alpha, because the kernel depends on the solution, then the kernel becomes C alpha itself. And then you approve the Schauder estimates and you get further Helder continuity. Then you iterate the Schauder estimates and you get the C infinity estimates. 
So this is, uh, these are all, this, is, this would be the program of regularity that is conditional to this uh, hydrodynamic bounds. If you want to get unconditional estimates, which is, you know, anyone's dream, then this could be completely out of reach. Uh, and it has similar difficulties as the problem in, in, in fluid equations. Uh, so uh, of course, uh, if we don't understand uh, compressible Navier-Stokes, uh, it's very unlikely that we will ever be able to uh, prove uh, an unconditional uh, well posedness and so for Boltzmann. And I'm not sure if I should expect the conditional well posedness to be, well, actually for condition, compressible Navier-Stokes, we know that it blows up. That's in the paper, in the, in the recent paper about the implosion singularities. But for, the, for Boltzmann, I don't know if I should expect uh, singularity or, or well posedness. I'm inclined to believe that this, the flow of the Boltzmann equation should develop implosion singularities. But in any case, this is, um, this is out of reach for the time being. And what is also out of reach is the soft potential case. So I mentioned this. <laughs> gamma and S, jargon, uh, then the infinity estimates don't work out. Uh, and we don't have to get the regularity even in the space homogeneous case. So anyway, that's going to be all for my talk. Uh, so thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Luis, for that very, very nice talk. Uh, and uh, thank you. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you again. So. Uh, yeah, sorry, really apologizing for the little technical difficulties that some, some of you already observed during the talk. I hope they didn't disturb too much. Myself, I- Was there fall. any other technical difficulty other than the one that I disconnected? No, you, it was like a little bit, it was like you were losing like a second or two here and there. But uh, uh, I, person, personally, I would, I, I, I could fall quite well. Okay. So uh, yes, because yeah, at some moment I saw, at some moment I saw a sign by Zoom saying that my internet connection was unstable. Yeah, yeah. So that's where usually you get these uh, little I cuts, know. but it was I, I never noticed anything really, really bad. Uh, so okay. yes, except so when I disconnected. Once more, thanks to Luis, uh, and uh, where is open to questions, please. I, I have a question. Um, do you expect weird behavior if you lower the regularity, like like it happens with Navier-Stokes? What do you mean lower the regularity? Like like, um, I mean right now you have this conditional result, but say you like uh, throw away the the, um, the these bounds on the macroscopic uh, quantities, and you just work with the equation itself. And um, say like you where you work with uh, like no regularity at all, and and like would you expect like a, a characteristically different behavior or? So do you mean something like a like? Like my question is, some is sort it of like are you closer to a heat equation I, or are you closer to a Navier-Stokes equation in 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 terms of? I think this is closer to Navier-Stokes than any, than anything else. To compressible Navier stokes. And so what I expect is the following. I would, I would expect that the solution can naturally evolve into an implosion singularity. That is like everything concentrates at one point, and then the mass and the energy density explode and converge to plus infinity at that one point, right? That's, that's one thing, which is implosion type of singularities. Now, what you're asking, I think, I, I don't, I think you're not asking that, but you're asking whether one can get some sort of convex integration type of techniques to get some really weird solutions, right? Uh, you know, the problem of, of, the, of the weird things that happen for Navier-Stokes is that it's not, uh, in my opinion, I mean, uh, this is something that I know Vlad is gonna kill me, but I don't think it's, a, it's something that the equation fails, but it's more a problem of the, of the, of the notion of solution, right? 
Uh, if you take a very, 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 very weak notion of solution, which is what you happens with Navier-Stokes, then you can what you what you verify basically is that the notion of solution doesn't really make any sense, right? It's not the equation that fails; it's the notion of solution that fails. So here, it's plausible that if you take a weak solution of the the Boltzmann equation, there might be a convex integration type technique that may lead to pathological solutions that don't do anything of what you would expect. Because this, what I'm, what I'm showing today were a priori estimate. So the, the solution has to be relatively nice for me to be able to carry out all the a priori estimates and prove these bounds that I'm proving, right? But if the solution is a really, really weak solution, my steps don't make sense to begin with, right? So it's perfectly possible that there are weak solutions of the, of the Boltzmann equation that do something completely pathological, that they don't conserve energy, that they start from zero and become non-zero. I don't know, it may happen, but that's more a failure of the notion of solution than a failure of the equation itself, okay? Same as for Navier-Stokes, right? But naturally, and this is a different issue, Naturally, I would expect that a solution that starts smooth and evolves smooth all the time may evolve into an implosion singularity. And that's unavoidable because that's actually something that is, is really the, the natural flow of the equation. Okay. Thank you. Does it answer your question or not? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you too. Are there any other questions, please? I have a quick question. Where exactly did you use the upper bound on the uh, entropy density? You just used the upper bound, not the lower bound, but it was... The, okay, I'm gonna, I didn't... If it's too technical, then... We I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I use it. Uh, I didn't explain it. Yeah. But I said at some point that I'm gonna use the macroscopic bounds to get this ellipticity for the kernel K, mm -hmm. right? The liticity yeah. for the kernel K uh, in, in, in has a lower bound and an upper bound mm -hmm. that has to be somehow comparable to the fractional Laplacian. This kernel K, because of how it's, uh, how it's defined, is gonna end up being the integral of F in a, on a hyperplane perpendicular, on a hyperplane through V perpendicular to the, to the segment from V to V prime, because those are the possible values of V star prime. So V star prime is in the, on this perpendicular plane. So if I have uh, if I have V here, V prime, the kernel K is going to be some integral of K, some integral of F along this plane. Mm -hmm. So if all I know about F are these bounds on the energy and entropy and mass, it's very, I cannot ensure that on any given hyperplane, F, the integral of F will be bounded below. So I need the, 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 the function F as a measure not to concentrate on a set of measures zero so that there are a, a, a set of positive directions in which this plane will hit values of F where F is bounded below. So I'm using the upper bound of the entropy to prevent F to concentrate on a set of measures zero. And the reason I don't want F to concentrate on a set of measures zero is because if F concentrates, then the kernel concentrates. And if the kernel concentrates, then it's, it's no not really elliptic okay. and I cannot as, a, apply the weak kernel inequality. Thank you. 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 Is that okay? Thank you. So for the, for the spreading lemma, I don't need it anymore because once I can clear a solid ball with the bound below, uh, then I already have a lot of points where F is bounded below. But the very first step, which is in order to clear the initial ball, uh, I need the, the upper bound on the entropy so that F is not concentrating on a set of measures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another question, please. Probably we have time for one more question or anyone. OK, 
Okay, so we are going to thank Luis once more for his talk today in this IAM seminar. Yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so thank you. Thank you all for participating. Thank you all for being here and keep coming. And uh, last thanks to Luis for his nice talk. And I suppose we are going to close the seminar. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.